good evening, everyone. My name is Danny Mando, along with my co-chair, David Kravitz. We welcome you this evening to another Sports Affinity Group. I'm going to hand this over now to my co-chair, David Kravitz. David? Hey, thank you. Thanks, Danny. Well, we have a good one for you tonight. And ho Hello and welcome to the Sports Affinity Webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 250 conservative men's clubs. Yes. You're welcome. Our members around, around the world it brings value and adds meaning to the lives of men and their families. FJMC has presented over 100 webinars. So as I said, I'm Dave Kravitz with Danny Mando, my co-chair. I will be hosting tonight. We're going to mute everyone so we can enjoy the presenter's remarks and we can take questions later in chat. It is now my pleasure to introduce Nolan Murrins, a past regional president of the Midwestern region, who will introduce our speaker. Okay, good evening to everyone. Thank you, uh, Danny and Dave. We have a really fine presentation and certainly during these challenging and struggling uh, times for all of us uh, as we relate to the uh, situation in the Middle East and specifically in Israel, uh, we have a program that hopefully will be a very uplifting, a very positive experience and uh, put us in a a uh, very positive frame of, of mind. Uh, one of the great benefits of FJMC is the people that you meet along the way and you connect with uh, directly. And uh, last uh, summer, when we were all meeting in Philadelphia, and we had a great uh, discussion with David Richman, who is the president of Better Angels Publishing in Philadelphia. Uh, rather than the uh, steal his thunder. I'm just going to say that he has uh, compiled and produced a beautiful uh, tribute, personal memoir, Dream and Beyond, which is described on the cover of the book. And I would encourage you, and uh, David will provide the details on uh, hopefully you having the desire to purchase the book and tell others uh, along the way that uh, this is something that is uh, uh, highly, highly re revered. Uh, the ratings on the book are, are really fantastic. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce David Richman. Thank you, Norwin. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here with everybody tonight. Uh, I want to tell you that um, my effort is going to be to sort of keep it short, as short as I can. I have so much material that I want to present and uh, it's it's really interesting stuff, but I'm going to try to present in, in as quick a way as I possibly can. Uh, in case you don't know, this book is Will Dyke and Me. Uh, it's a memoir about the days when my father, Ike Richmond, started the Philadelphia 76ers. And uh, at a certain point in time, he made a trade for Will Chamberlain, who was a personal friend and a client of his. And uh, shortly thereafter, he moved him into our house. And uh, Will was my roommate uh, during my 10th grade in high school. And that's what this is about. But on a much deeper level. So, David, before before you continue, I was we were remiss. So what we're going to do is ask everyone not just to stay on, on mute, but put your questions into the chat and then we will feed David the questions. Either he'll take them himself or I'll feed them to him after his formal presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, David. Thanks. So this is actually a very Jewish story. And uh, part of that is, I'll give you a little background on myself. Uh, my grandfather, was a, uh, an, a yeshiva student in Vilna studying to become an Orthodox cantor. And the family had to run, as many of them did. And he came to America. And we were a very religious family and extremely observant. And when I um, <clears throat> we moved to the suburbs, a uh, place called Melrose Park, my parents were looking to put me into a, a Hebrew school there. And the one that was closest and the one that would have me was a place called Mikveh Israel. Mikveh Israel was, is still, I think, one of the five oldest synagogues in the United States. It was founded in 1740 uh, and was in full swing during the American Revolution. 
And uh, it's, uh, you know, very orthodox place. And, and the thing that's funny is that when, as I was growing up uh, in this Hebrew school, um, I only had two kids in my class. So I'd be in these Hebrew school classes to, uh, three times a week, and it would be me and two other kids and the rabbi and, and a, a teacher. So as you can imagine, I really got a lot of information, uh, you know, put into me during that period of time, which I was very fond of. Um, the basics of what we're going to talk about tonight have some elements of that to it, and as you'll see. Uh, but what I want to mention before I get into everything is that what I was taught in the in in this world that I was in is the essence of the religion. And that's not just Judaism, it's any religion. The essence of it is, is that you have a soul and the idea is to get you back into, you know, communication, touch with, and ultimately merge with the supreme being, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, I stay away from certain names. So the thing is that the idea that I was always taught by the rabbis, and this was a lot of stuff, is that you learn your way back to to the supreme being you learn your way back and the thing is pay attention to the lessons that life is teaching you along the way they may be surprising but you'll see that uh you know they're unfolding something to you that this is a preface to a couple of things that happened um so besides interestingly besides having such a presence of judaism in our life from before I even have a memory, we also were deeply bonded to an NBA team called the Philadelphia Warriors because my father was the general counsel of that team. Okay. And we're going to, this is the jumping off point that we're going to, we're going to go from, but we're going to go back a little ways to talk a little bit about the history of Jewish immigration, which led into some of this. Okay. So in 1840, you had approximately 15,000 Jews in the United States. Uh, there was a total population of about 17 million and about, we had 15,000 Jews. Uh, and around 1840, uh, a group of people, German Jews who were you know, pretty well-to-do and had a, a nice life going on, decided that it was time for them maybe to start coming over here. And in a very orderly way, they started to come. And what you had was over a 20 year period, about 200,000 of them came. And these were people who, when they came, they had family here, they had businesses, they had money. There was an incredible assimilation into American culture and into American society. Okay. By 1960, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 1860, they had assimilated in, and you had 11,000 Jewish soldiers in the Union Army, all right? And interestingly enough, which most people don't know, there were seven Jewish generals, and there was one Jewish governor. And the funny thing is, General Frederick Solomon and Wisconsin Governor Edward Solomon were brothers, and mm -hmm. they were a very prominent family. And by the end of 1880, you had about 300,000 Jews in America. Again, very assimilated. Reform Judaism had, had taken hold very nicely. And they were really, like, you look at these two guys, these are, you know, American, American men of, of, of the Civil War, okay? So, 1880, right? The pogroms began in Russia. And by the way, for those of you who don't, know this and i didn't really know it until i researched it i thought that the pogroms were like these random uprisings of anti-semitic gangs who came and beat beat up the jewish people and did this whole thing that's not what it was it was actually systemized state run by the government massacres they would come into the town soldiers on horseback kill rape do all this stuff uh you had 200,000 Jews in, in 1881. It started within 20 years. You had 2 million Jews had fled and come to America. 2 million Jews were here. And they were living, a lot of them were living in abject poverty. 
Now, I wish I had more time to go into this little side thing that I'm going to tell you, but I don't, but I'm going to give you an overview. The generation that ran, like my grandfather and probably most of the people on this call, it would probably be your grandparents. They ran and they, this was not an orderly trip to the United States. This was run for your life. We're getting killed. We got to get out of here with whatever we have. Look at these people, the clothes on our backs. And they came to America and many of them were deeply impoverished, deeply, deeply impoverished. You had tenements, you had horrible living conditions, six, seven people in a one bedroom apartment with no running water. Now, see if you can grasp this, okay? Within a generation, that generation it ran, the generation after them, which was the first generation of American Jews who were born here, most of them, what these guys accomplished is beyond comprehension. For instance, the Nobel Prize was started in 1901, and so far over 600 Nobel Prizes have been given out. 120 of those 600 went to these American Jews. Two were Peace Prizes, four in literature, 17 in chemistry, 26 in economics, 34 in physics, 37 in medicine. And this doesn't include Albert Einstein, who when he won his Nobel Prize was a citizen of Germany. Now you had hundreds of thousands of these children, of these, these immigrants who ran with the shirts on their back, hundreds of thousands of them became lawyers, doctors, businessmen, profession, uh, pro uh, professors, all these people, okay? Now, again, I wish I had more time for this part of it because it's really fascinating, but there was a group that went into show business because at the same time that all this stuff was happening, mass communication started happening. You had radio, then you had television, you had movies, you had all this stuff. And the two earliest mega, mega stars there was a Jewish kid named Eric Wise and, and, a, and a kid named Asa Yolson. Okay, Wise named himself Harry Houdini and Asa named himself Al Jolson. These were the biggest entertainers. From there, you've got, you know, these radio guys. Benny Kabelski had a show. Nady Birnbaum had a show. Benny called himself Jack Benny. Nady called himself George Burns, okay? I have a pretty long list of this stuff. Some of the actors... Manny Goldenberg was one of the scariest uh, gangsters. Nobody's been scarier in this role than Manny Goldenberg. Of course, in those days, he was calling himself Edward G. Robinson. And this goes on and on and on and on. The comedians, Phil Silversmith, Phil Silvers, Melvin Kaminsky, Mel Brooks, on and on. Uh, I can't help do, doing these two. Sammy and Minnie Marks had some kids, Leonard Adolph, Julius, Milton, and Herbert. Took the names Chico, Harpo, Groucho, Gummo, and Zeppo. And then there were these two brothers, uh, Moses and Jerry Horowitz. And they got together with their cousin, Larry Fine, uh, uh, Louis Feinberg, and they made up a group that called them the Three Stooges. On and on and on, Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to jump off of this with this last thing. What these guys did and women, how they changed American culture with their art. And these are writers. These are directors. These are actors. These are producers. Unbelievable. Listen to this. OK. Listen to these four shows and, and everybody on this call is old enough to remember how transformative and powerful these four shows were. The Twilight Zone, unbelievable. Rod Serling, right? The Dick Van Dyke Show was the first comedy that brought out all these deeper things and family and all that. You know, Carl Reiner, all in the family. Look what that show did. Norman Lear and MASH, Larry Gelbart. So I don't have time to go into this. It's a fascinating thing. You know, we're not even talking about the Gershwins and we're not talking about J.D. Salinger and you know, Neil Simon and all these people, okay? So let's jump from there to here. <clears throat> so the Jews started running in 1881. And in 1891, 
James Nesmith invented a new game which became known as basketball. Okay. Now, this is something you probably don't know. Okay. When these Jews came over, there was so much anti-Semitism and there was such a, you know, stereotype of these kids who did nothing but study and they didn't work and their bodies were scrawny and all that, that their, these, these guys, their parents actually made a conscious decision to get these kids athletic and get them into America, make them into American kids. And at the same time that this was happening, basketball started to catch on. And basketball was thought of as a bastard game. It wasn't a very good game. But the push to these Jewish kids was something interesting because they didn't have to have a field. They didn't, it wasn't baseball or football. It was an indoor place. And the first YMHA put a basketball court up in 1900. And it all started. And guess what happened? Which you may or may not know. Okay the Jews started to dominate the sport. They were great at it. They were really, really great at it. So what you had was <clears throat> you had this guy named Eddie Gottlieb, who, who became like a member of our family. He had a team in Philadelphia called the Philadelphia Spas. And Spas stood for South Philadelphia Hebrew Association. And the reason he gave him the name spas was because the association gave him the money for the uniforms with the caveat that that would be the name of the team. Okay. So Gotti named them that and they were great. Now get this, the sport got bigger and bigger and the Jews got better and better. And they totally dominated the college sport in the twenties and thirties. I don't know if you know this story, but March 3rd, 1934, right? NYU is playing CCNY in the garden, 15,000 fans, okay? The coach of NYU boasted that we have a very strong team. We got one Swede, we got one Irishman, and eight Jews. That's how strong we are. Their starting lineup was Goldstein, Pincus, Rubenstein, Rosen, and Klein. Klein was the center. He dominated the whole, all, the entire league at the time. And his name was Erwin King Kong Klein. He was 6'3 and weighed 210. Okay, so Gotti had this team and all this stuff was happening. Okay, so let's jump ahead to 1945. This is a fourth grade class in the uh, Cobbs Creek area of West Philadelphia. And there happened to be a pretty tall kid, as you can see in the center back there, okay? 1952, Gotti buys the Philadelphia Warriors. That's him on the right there. My father executed the deal because Gotti was my father's gym teacher at South Philadelphia High School. They became very dear friends. And from the time my father got out of law school, he was doing things for Gotti's teams. And Gotti bought the Warriors and they had this team. And one thing about Gotti is he kept his ear to the ground about everything that was happening in Philadelphia. So as you remember, in 45, there was this fourth grader, right? Let's jump ahead seven years. The fourth grader is in 11th grade. His name is Will Chamberlain. Nobody can cover him. He's dominating the league. He, he's he's scoring 30, he's scoring 50 points in high school games. He's unbelievable. 200 colleges are looking to try to get him to, jo to, to join there. My father and Gotti had done a thing in the NBA that they had set up something called the territorial draft, which basically said that if you have somebody in high school and he's looking like the whole city loves him and he's going to be a high school hero, a, a hometown hero, you have the right to draft him. So when Wilt was a junior, and here he was, they drafted him. And basically what happened was my father and Gotti drove out to see him in, over, in, in his house. And they said to him, listen, you're with us now, and you're going to be joining us, and you're on our team. We've got you. And my father supposedly said to him, according to Wilt, my father said to him, look, 
you're going to be a very rich man and you're going to make a lot of money and you're going to make it fast. And you're going to have to be careful because as fast as it can come is as fast as it can go. Now, I'm the lawyer for the team. And my father, by the way, had his he had started his own law firm with a couple of partners, Richmond Price and Jamison. They were getting pretty powerful in Philadelphia. He was a pretty strong character. And he said to Wilt, you know, I'll take care of, of your stuff if you want to. And they shook hands on that, supposedly. So Wilt went to Kansas, okay? And what he did in the summers is he used to go up to a place called Kutcher's in the Catskills. And he was the, he was this famous, the, he was, he always said he, he you know, he, he was the, the best at, you know, unpacking and, you know, getting stuck. He was the best bellman that they ever had. And that that's what he did every summer. And Kutcher's was a big deal. It was really, really a, a nice place in the Catskills, right? And Wilt was up there every summer. And here's four real giants of that particular day. There's Will, there's Gotti next to him, there's my father, and there's Milt Kutcher, who owned Kutcher's. Uh, and Milt, it's interesting about Wilt. Wilt was very closely bonded to certain Jewish families where he was like one of the families. That's the way he was with us. And that's the way he was with Milt and Helen. And um, their son, Mark, who took over afterwards, was also very, very dear friends with Wilt. So this is the way this type of stuff happened in those days. Gotti and my father called their friend Abe Saperstein, who had a team uh, that, you know, played around. You probably have heard of them. I'll tell you their name in a second. And they said to Wilt, they said, look, you know, senior year of Kansas, big deal. Maybe you win a championship. Maybe you don't. We got something a lot better for you. And Wilt said, OK. So they made a deal with their buddy, Abe, and Wilt joined the Globies, the Harlem Globetrotters. Now, it's 1958, okay? Wilt got 60 thousand dollars to play one season with the globe trotters and they threw in a ten thousand dollar signing bonus he traveled the world that particular year and he had incredible experiences and at the end of that year he was the number one recognized celebrity in the world every place the globe trotters played was sold out and it was a build-up to him joining the warriors it was a very very big deal and he had a wonderful time doing it. So now, oh, I'm glad I have my notes here. There's a story, a quick story I want to tell you. Uh, one of the things about Wilt, which was a little bizarre, is he, he alcohol didn't affect him. He could drink anybody under the table. He could have 15 drinks at more. Okay, and what happened in Moscow is they got there and it was a very big deal. They were playing in Moscow and Khrushchev invited the team over to hang out with him afterwards. And he brought the case of, of Russia's finest uh, vodka there. And the way the story went is when the night went on, everybody dropped out one at a time and it just ended up with Wilton Khrushchev slamming shots until the early hours of the morning, which is, you know, he, he was very happy with that story. Anyway, it's time now for Will to join the Warriors. And this is a, a here he is signing the uh, mock contract with Gotti. And here he is with my dad, Ike, executing the real deal. And uh, he joined the team. And basically what happened was, uh, it was October of 1959, October 24th was his debut. And I don't have time really to get into what happened here, but the entire sport got altered. They had to change so many rules. When Will, uh, I think it was when he was in college or maybe when he was coming into the pros, they had to change a, a rule, which was on a foul shot, you had to be, you had to be behind the line to shoot the ball because Will, could stand flat-footed at the top of the key, take two steps and jump from behind the foul line and dunk the ball. That's just one of many, many, many rules that they changed because of that. He was scoring so much. He was averaging 50 points a game. He was averaging 
something like 40 rebounds. A typical thing would happen in those days. They would have a bad night and 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 they the, the next day the paper would be out and it would be Warriors lose. Wilt held, Wilt held to 38. I was like, oh God, they held Wilt to under 40. Oh my God, you know. So these were very heady times. And I was a little kid and uh, they gave me a jacket and we, we always sat on the front row under the basket at every game. I don't remember a time in my life when there, when I wasn't going to services or Hebrew school or whatever, five to seven hours a week. And I don't remember a time where I was, wasn't going to one or two basketball games every week as well. And by the way, Here's something you may or may not know. Wilt hated the nickname Wilt the Stilt. He couldn't stand it. His favorite nickname was the Big Dipper. And the reason he liked the Big Dipper was because he had it from the time he was probably in junior high school. If you look at the if, if, if you look at the door jam behind him, you see that it's under his head. So whenever he came in and out of a room, he had to dip to get in and out of it. And that's why they called him the Big Dipper. So, also about Wilt, is Wilt was an incredible partier. He had a lot of money at this point in time, and he was very smart. And what he did was, and he also had an apartment in New York because Philly was way too small for him. So, there were two places in Harlem that were the center of Black life in Harlem, and Wilt bought one of them. He called it was called Small's Paradise, and he bought it and called it Big Wilt Small's Paradise. And it used to be open a certain amount of hours. And when Wilt bought it, he took it to 24-7. The place never shut down. He was an insomniac. He didn't have to sleep that much. So let's go to March of 1962. An interesting week in March of 62 was my bar mitzvah. There I am with my father. There I am with Zadie, my grandfather, who I wish I had more time. I don't even have time to touch him, but he's very central to the book because he was he was a, a, an extremely religious guy, but he was also into the Baal Shem Tov and Kabbalism and all this stuff. He was an amazing character. He's a very, very central figure in the book. But on the same week of my bar mitzvah, Wilt had quite a, quite a night. And of course he set that record and the Knicks, who he played against, half of them dro drove him home that night because he went back up to, to New York uh, to party after that. Now, at the end of this year, okay, and this is the end of, of this part of, of the program, of this presentation, at the end of this year, Gotti sold the team to San Francisco. The Warriors were sold to San Francisco. Wilt moved. They were out of our life, okay? And I, I, I'm going to give you two things to think about as Wilt as a player, okay? When he was a player, he was always double or triple teamed. All the things that he scored were were under ridiculous situations, okay? Um, Mindy Rudolph, who was one of the refs, said a fam famous comment about Wilt back in these days and all the way through too. He said, we, didn't, we couldn't call every foul on Wilt. If we'd have called every foul, there wouldn't have been a game because any time he had the ball and more than that, they fouled him all the time. We just had to pick and choose the flagrant ones, okay? Now, see if you can grasp this as to how strong of a character this guy was. At the end of 62, okay, he had played every minute of every game in the season and in the playoffs, there was one game where he got thrown out in the fourth quarter and he missed 13 minutes of that quarter. Other than that, he never sat down. It's beyond belief how strong he was and how powerful he was. So that's the end of this particular time. And now we're going to move to another time. My father had been negotiating during the time that he was, he was doing the deal for Gotti, selling it to a, a group with with this guy Franklin Muley out of San Francisco, my father was negotiating with a guy named Danny Biasone to buy the Syracuse Nationals. And he wanted to buy the team. And it, it, think about this, it was it was seven hundred thousand dollars to buy the team. 
1963, and he only had 350. And he went around to everybody that he knew to try to get a partner and nobody would touch it. And one of the guys who, who, who helped design this logo, this is the logo my father designed with his cousin, Mel Richmond, who had a really great advertising agency. My father asked Mel to come in with them as partners. And Mel said, Ike, professional sports has peaked. Before you know it, you guys are going to be charging $5 to go to a basketball game. Who the <laughs> hell is going to go to a basketball game for $5? I'm out. So my father had his closest friend from childhood was a guy named Irv Kozlov who was again, like an uncle to, to our family and my brother and sister and I, and he caused my father was just bending his arm. Come on, come on, come on. Cause had a paper company that was doing great. He didn't want to do it. Finally, he said to my father, okay, I'll give you the money, but I'm not doing anything because at the, my paper company is exploding. You have to be the general manager and do all that. My father said, yeah, okay, fine. So they did it. Now, what happened was Dolph Shays, by the way, was the star of that Syracuse team. Now, again, I don't have enough time to go into this. I'm going to rush through this, but I want you to understand something. In the days of the Warriors, we hated the Boston Celtics worse than you could possibly imagine. The only person that could hate a team more was how bad the Celtics fans hated us. Okay. But the second worst team in the league that we hated almost as bad as the Celtics were the Nationals. And when my father got that team started, nobody came to the games. I mean, nobody. It was empty, dead empty. They barely had, a, a, there was hardly any radio. The press barely covered them. It was a disaster. A month into the first season, President Kennedy gets shot. They're bleeding money. Nothing's happening. And it's, it's, it's a total, total disaster. Things, my father sees this guy named Luke Jackson. He goes over to Japan for the Olympics. He, he, you know, drafts him. He brings him back. Luke's there. The te team's a little better. I mean, you're talking about 2,500 people in convention hall, which sat 10,000 people. You know, they'd score a basket. This would be the sound of the applause, you know, like that. My father would do these things. So oh, we're going to have free basketball night. We're going to have free, bring a free date night. Uh, buy one, get two uh, for, for 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 penance and Nobody came. There would be games where I would have friends and we were giving away basketballs. Nobody came. We would just pack up the basketballs into the truck. The way the book starts, the way Will Dyke and Me starts, is it's I'm in I'm in 10th grade. I'm in my room and my father walks into my room and he's leaving for the all-star game uh, in St. Louis. And he, just, he swears me to secrecy and he says, I just got Will. I didn't even know what he meant, but what he meant was he just executed the biggest trade in sports history at the time. And he brought Wilt to the 76ers. Now at that time, there we are. There's Wilt when he first landed in Philadelphia making the trade. There's Ike Richmond, who's got his own law firm and all this stuff. He's also the general manager of the team and the general counsel. And here I am. You know, 16-year-old David Richmond, Cheltenham High School, standard American kid. You know, here we go, right? So the next thing that happens, I should have said this before the slide. When Wilt joined the team, suddenly everything went crazy. Attendance was basically almost sold out for the first two games. Boston came for the third game. Wilt with this team that he had never even played with blew the Celtics out of the out of the uh, convention hall, and the the city just went crazy in love with the 76ers. Every game was a sellout at that point. So I'm in high school. It's you know it's a couple of weeks and maybe a month after the trade, and I come home and my mother and our domestic helper are in my room. My stuff's getting moved out. My mother says, we got to tie your twin beds together to make them into a into a, a double. Why? Wilt's moving in. He's going to be here tonight. Daddy's making them. So I don't have time to really go into the story of daddy's making them other than they were that close. And my father had his, his uh, 
physician, Stan Lorber, examined Will, and he said, Ike, you can't let this guy run up to New York and do all this stuff. He's got some pancreatic issues. So he moved him into our house. And I'm in 10th grade, and that's what's happening. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, um, let me get to where I am. I don't want that story. I'm going to tell you a little, I'm, Actually, let me see how much time we have. All right, I'm going to read you something really, really fast, um, just to get just to give you a feel of what life was like. Okay, uh, this is from the book. One day, Wilt decided we should. I had just gotten my license. One day, Wilt decided that we should drive over the city limit to a commercial part in North Broad Street where he could give me some pointers on how to squeeze into a parking space. He said it wasn't all that hard. I think you're good enough to listen to the radio now, he commented as we drove along. I turned it on and soon Sam Cooke came on singing Another Saturday Night. Oh my God, my theme song, Wilde exclaimed. Turn it up, turn it up. I made it louder, but it wasn't loud enough for him. Come on, he said. I blasted it and he started singing as we drove along. He actually had a fine singing voice and had made a record once. He kept snapping his fingers along to the music right next to my ear. His hand was probably three times the normal size and every snap was like a firecracker exploding in my soul, in my skull. When the song finally ended, he spotted a parking space in front of one of the stores. Oh, okay, okay, this is perfect. Pull over and let's see what you can do. I pulled up parallel to the car that was in front of the open space and tried to back in, but I started having all my usual troubles, cutting the wheel at the wrong time, either too early or too late. I had to keep pulling out and starting over, which I did four or five times as he kept coaching me. All right, he finally said, look, it's not all that hard. Here, let me help you. Just do what I tell you. He jumped out of the car and stood on the sidewalk. Okay, turn the wheel now. Turn, he shouted, gesturing with his hands. Come on, turn it, turn it. You got to cut it harder. I was focused on trying to park and pretty much lost touch with everything other than trying to squeeze the car into the space, which was probably too tight to begin with. Hey, Will, 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 hey, Will, I heard someone shout. I looked over at the sidewalk where he was standing, and there must have been 40 kids surrounding him. I didn't know where they had come from. I was so wrapped up in what I was doing, I hadn't seen them approach. They were gathered around them like iron filings stuck to a magnet. I could see their faces and they were all filled with joy, like they were unexpectedly getting a gift from on high. Quite simply, they were out of their mind. Wilt looked at all of them for a minute and then flashed in one of his ear-to-ear -ear smiles, his enormous white teeth reflecting the sunlight back at them. Wilt, sign this, one of the kids held up a notebook with a pen. Yeah, the other kids shouted and started scrambling for pens and papers. Can we have your autograph, please? He took a quick look at the small crowd and could see that more kids were starting to come. The buzz on the sidewalk was clearly underway. I can't, kids. I can't right now. I'm late for an appointment. And I really got to go. He touched his wrist, pointing to an imaginary watch. Everybody groaned. Oh, no. Oh, come on, Will, please. Come on. One kid had a basketball. He tossed it over to Wilt, who grabbed it in midair with his right hand. Then he stood tall and held the ball up high against the sky. He looked like the Statue of Liberty, with the ball at least nine feet in the air. The awestruck kids fell silent for a few seconds, gazing up at the living Colossus who stood before them. Then he casually flipped the ball back to the kid who caught it and seemed ready to leave his body in bliss. I'm sorry, kids, I really have to go. Wilt opened the back door of the car. Be good now, he said, and hopped in. Come on, he muttered to me quietly but sharply. Come on, we got to get out of here right now. The scene on the street had turned into mini mayhem. About 50 other people, including a bunch of adults, had come rushing over, and more were on their way. Wilt wanted me to move before any of them started surrounding the car, which would have put us in a completely different situation. As I pulled out carefully, he put the window down and leaned his head and shoulders out of the car. He waved to them with a hand that would be the biggest one they would ever see in their lives, and it was sure to grow in their memories as the years went by. Be good now, kids, he shouted back to them as I pulled away. Be good. This kind of thing had been going on with Wilt for years, and he had a specific way of handling it. Whenever a group gathered, 
he would quickly decide whether to sign autographs or not, and he would never start if he couldn't sign them all. That would create a bad situation for the kids who missed out, and not only would they be disappointed, but it would generate negative word of mouth, so it's better just to say no to all of them. Now, I knew Wilt was cognizant of the PR aspect of it, but I think to him, the inherent injustice of it, the idea of hurting some poor kid who was left out, was far more important. We drove off and left the parallel parking for another day. So, Dave, it's 20 of 10. How much more time do I have to do this? Well, it's really... Uh... You, do you want to keep them going? Well, let's see if how many questions we have in the chat. Let's check the questions because this is phenomenal. I did, I haven't even started yet to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you one thing. Let's do one more slide. Ready? Okay. All right. All right so I'm back in my room, and with Wilt, what one of the things that happened with Wilt was he would lay down on the floor in my room, and I would sit there, and we would play four deck uh, war. And we just play cards for hours. And he'd always be talking to me about girls. I was 16. You know, he knew me when I was a little kid back in those old days. He used to call me little guy. Now, because I had Beatles hair, sometimes he used to call me Ringo or other times he'd call me big guy. So, and he's always pressing me about girls, girls, who am I seeing? Who am I going out with? What's going on? And I finally said to him, well, what about you, you know? You, you know, you're never seeing anybody steady or anything like that. And he said to me, I'm not getting married in this life. I'm just not doing it. And I'm not having any steady girlfriends because as soon as I do, they want to get married. So I'm not doing that. And then he said to me, he goes, there is somebody, though, that I would tell you I'm kind of in love with. And he gets up and he goes over to his wallet and he pulls out a... Uh, black and white <coughs> Polaroid, which was really new for the time. And he hands it to me. And it's a picture of a blonde woman, totally naked. I mean, nothing on walking out of the ocean. And I'm looking at it. And I'm trying to figure, I know this person, who the heck is this? But I don't know who it is. And he goes, don't you know who that is? I said, well, I think so. He goes, it's Kim Novak starts telling me this whole story that they're having this relationship. She's the coolest person he's ever known. She was at the top at this particular point in the time. Not only was she one of the number one, you know, sex sirens, sex goddesses of film. She was also one of the greatest actresses there ever was. She was incredible. Hitchcock used her. She was amazing. And Will told me a great story about how when they wanted to get out of town one day, they went to Muir Woods. They went to where the sequoias are. And one of the things about Wilt, which I haven't gotten into, but I will tell you briefly, is Wilt was a freak, okay? Somebody once said about Wilt, the first time I ever saw him, I re reminded me of the first time, the first time I ever saw him in person reminded me of the first time I ever stood up in, in front of the Empire State Building. It was the biggest thing I'd ever seen, okay? But when they went to the sequoias, to the 100-foot-tall trees, nobody noticed them. And that's why he loved to go there because nobody noticed him. You know, I had a friend who was doing a film that he was going to, he was going to finance and Robert De Niro was going to meet him in the village. And he was walking down the street with the producer and some guy came and they chatted with the guy for like seven or eight blocks and the guy left. And my friend said, well, where's De Niro? And she said, that was him. He goes, that guy in the sunglasses and the hat was De Niro. She goes, yeah. Well, you know, Wilt, if he like De Niro puts on sunglasses and a hat, he's no longer De Niro. Wilt puts on sunglasses and a hat. Somebody go, hey, there's Will Chamberlain wearing sunglasses and a hat. So this is, I would tell you that we're two thirds of the way in, maybe a little less. But I can move, I can jump it. So tell me what you want to do. You have 10 more minutes, my friend. 10 minutes. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move it fast. I'm gonna tell you something very, very quickly um, that I, I really wanna tell you this, just to give you a sense of the relationship between my father and Wilt. When, when, when Wilt and my father used to hang out in my father's uh, office every night, 
And one night before a game, uh, my father called me. I used to drive Will to a lot of the games. My father called me and he said, tell Will I need to see him before the game. It happened to be game five of the playoffs against Cincinnati. And we get there and I, and I get there and Will goes upstairs to the dressing room with the team. My father comes in. He's got his briefcase. He opens his briefcase. He puts a few things on the table. The team comes down. They all go through the curtain. My father motions to Will. He comes and stands there. The rest of the team goes out. And we can hear through the curtain murmurings, like uh, murmurings like that. Will, by the way, before a game, is in combat mode. This was not a game. This was not fun. This was a fight. And some of the biggest, strongest men in the world were ganging up on him, hitting him hard and just playing him dirty. So when we were there, Wilt was in his uniform. He's standing there getting ready to go out. My father is pointing down to places in, a, I guess, a contract. And Wilt is signing his name without even looking at what he was signing. And <laughs> it was just incredible. Can you imagine in this day and age, a no star way. signing something without 10 lawyers looking at it? Wilt didn't even know what he was signing. And at a certain point in time, he was ready to go out and he did. And we went behind him. This place went crazy. It was unbelievable. I'm going to jump through how we lost to the Celtics that year, uh, how Wilt had gone crazy at the end of the seventh game. Uh, we were down like something like nine points. Wilt went nuts in the last uh, five minutes and got him to within one point. And Russell went to, to uh, throw the ball in and hit the guide wire. We had it. We threw it in. Havlicek stole the ball. We lost. Okay. I come home that the next day and Wilt's uniform is laid out in my room and he's gone. Okay. He left that for me as a gift. My mother because this was before the day of, of uh, you know, memorabilia. She just threw it out. His his rookie, unif rookie uniform went for 1.2 about a month ago. But that's a different story. All right, let me jump to this other thing now. My father... After the season, he goes out and he gets Wally Jones... And he gets Billy Cunningham. So now he put together, this is Ike's dream team. He had Hal Greer uh, with the with the Nats. He had Chet the Jet Walker with the Nats. He brought Wilt in after he had gotten uh, Cool Hand Luke Jackson. And then he got Wally Jones and he got Billy Cunningham. To the city, he was the Big Dipper, Cool Hand Luke, Chet the Jet, High Gear, Hal Greer, Wally Wonder, and the Kangaroo Kid. This was the team. He had put together, we were going to win the championship. We were going to Boston to beat the Celtics up there and show them who we were. Now, this is something I don't want to gloss over too much. The night before the Boston game, I'm in 10th grade. I go to sleep and I have a crystal clear dream, like no dream I've ever had before that my father died. I dreamt what happened to me and it was totally clear. And I told a friend of mine on my way to driving him to, uh, to high school that morning. The next night, it happened. Exactly the way I dreamt it. <clears throat> he dropped dead, 13-13, the score tied at the, at, the, at the garden. By the way, Wilt was really good friends with Bill Russell. And my father happened to be very good friends with Red Auerbach. They were... Uh, fraternity brothers in different schools. When my father dropped on the floor, Red came rushing over with the team doctor, but the doctor told my mother that he had died before his body had hit the ground. So what happened was after the game, Wilt sat in the locker room and didn't lift his head up for 15 minutes. The press was there. He finally looked at him and said, I've known Ike ever since I was in high school. I can't look back on anything I have or anything that I am that I don't owe to him. He was my friend and my advisor, but he was much more than a friend to me, much more. Okay, now I'm really going to rush. I'm sorry to do it. But bear in mind that the sudden death of my father at age 16 was an incredibly traumatic and difficult experience for me. But deeper than that was the fact that I had dreamt it in detail 
the night before it happened. How was that possible? I know that it happened, okay? So now it was time for the team to really go. It was the next year and uh, they started playing and basically uh, nobody could stay on the court with them. They blew the league away. 68 and 13 was what they had. Uh, they went on to play the, the uh, Celtics. Uh, they, they played Cincinnati Royals in the semis. They beat them uh, three to one. They went to play Boston. They blew them out four to one. They went to, uh, to San Francisco and they beat them four to two. It was incredible. They got everything that they wanted. Now, one thing that I want to tell you is when Will, that's this is a picture of my mother and my father. And by the way, the guy in the background is a guy named Dave Zinkoff, who was the great Zink, the announcer at the 76ers game. When Wilt lived with us, he was like a son to my parents and he was very, very close to my father and my mother. I mean, you know, he was close to my father, very close to my mother. So after the game, they gave Wilt the ball and Wilt had a meeting with the team. And he said, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I want to give this ball to Claire Richmond. If anybody has any objections, let me know. But that's what I'd like to do. And when they arrived, which is the picture, he came walking out with the ball and he spotted my brother and and me over in the corner. And he came walking over to us and he handed us the ball. And he said, this is for your mother. Please give it to me with my love. How much more time do I have? About five minutes. Okay. Five or six minutes. Good, I can do it. So I'm going to rush through this really fast. Now this is Wilt, you know, after he gets traded to the Lakers, I stay in touch with him. You know, he's got this goof around thing going with Ali that they're going to fight each other. But it was it was something that they did with Cosell just to get money when they needed it. Wilt was having a tough time with Jack Ken Cook. So he Ali said, OK, let's do it. And then he, he made a big contract after that. They were actually very good friends. Now, as you probably know, Wilt went and built this mansion in LA outside of, uh, it's, it's overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And he built this incredible structure there. And I spent uh, the summer in San Francisco in 69 and he invited me to come down to LA. And uh, I had some friends and I hung out with him and I spent, I spent the day with him in this house. And all I want to tell you is it was such a pleasure for me to see him finally in an environment that fit him because all our life, you know, when he was living in our house, it was pathetic. He was like living in a dollhouse, but he was living in this place and it was really terrific. And on this particular day, he said, let's go. I got to take you to this pancake place in Beverly Hills. It's the best. So we drive over there, we sit down at the table and he puts these two big things that look like bricks wrapped in, pa in, in white paper on the table. And I see Caesar's Palace on one of them. The waitress comes with the bill. He rips open one, one of the things and pulls a hundred out. And I see it's all hundreds. And I look, they're 10,000 each. He had $20,000 in cash sitting on the table, pays the waitress with a hundred. We get up, we start walking out onto the streets of Beverly Hills and he's holding the cash in his hands. And it's obvious that it's a really lot of money. And we're walking along. And I said, I said, what are you doing? He goes, what do you mean? I said, what are you walking down the street with all this money for? He goes, why? I said, well, well somebody might, might try to steal it from you. And he just <laughs> chuckled and he goes, well, they'd have to try to take it from me first. The guy had no self-doubt in himself whatsoever. So to wrap it up, I don't have time to tell you his records, but he played his last NBA game in 73. 72 of his records still stand. He was like nothing else. And by the way, and I haven't really gotten to this, he was a great guy. He was very charismatic, extremely intelligent. And when I was telling you that he was signing the contract with my father, there was a there was a three part documentary uh, that was done by Showtime recently about Wilt. And one of his friends in it, I watched it, said, you know, Wilt didn't trust many people. He said, let me correct that a little bit. Wilt didn't trust anybody, but Wilt trusted Ike. Wilt really trusted Ike. So, you know, this is about my father and Gotti. This is the this is a mag an article from Philadelphia Magazine. And I'm going to wrap it up a little bit by telling you that Wilt had another side to him that I really knew pretty well. He 
was a very deep thinker. And sure, it was fine that he was seven one and you know all this stuff, and he was probably the greatest athlete anybody ever knew. And Schwarzenegger said when he took him to the gym, he just could not believe he never saw weights lifted like that that Will could do. But this was Wilt wrote a book towards the end of his life, and he had these things called Wiltisms. And this is what I really feel about him, and this is what he would really say: size has never been a barometer for measuring the worth of a man unless you're talking about his heart. And I want to leave you with one thing that I really don't have time to get into, but I had another dream six months after my father died, and it was as vivid as that first dream. And it was a whole long thing that happened in it. And at one point in time, I said to him, because he looked amazing, he looked younger, he was tan and healthy. And all of a sudden I said, wait a minute, you're dead, you died. You know, what are you doing here? You died. And he just chuckled. And he said, no, no, that wasn't real. I said, what do you mean it wasn't really good? So it, 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 it's a trick. It's a stunt. It's a gimmick. And I looked confused. And then this is what he said to me, which is the end of the presentation. And you can take it for whatever it's worth. But this is what he said to me. And it really went in. There is no death. It's just a public relations stunt that God came up with to get people to think about him. That's all it is. So guys, I hope I brought it in on time and uh, or close. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you, if you, you know, it's all in the book in detail. So it's in there. And also, by the way, before I let you go, I do have a podcast about, about things to do with personal growth. It's free. It'll come to you every Tuesday uh, morning at 11. You can sign up with this link or if you'd like, there's my email address. There's a link to buy the book if you want. And there's my email address. You can send me an email. If you'd like, tell me what your experience was. If you want, I'll sign you up for the podcast and I'd love to hear from you. So okay, David, fellas, uh, thank you. Yeah, so David, that was terrific. First of all, we had uh, 70 people, uh, which is above our average. So okay. you certainly uh, attracted a, a big crowd tonight. So and it was outstanding. Um, how does one get your book? Well, there's a link. It's on Amazon and it's all on all other major retailers. Go on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, whoever you go on that's, uh, that sells them, and you can buy them there. It's uh, There's a hardback, there's a softback, and then there's an electronic version readily available. And there is over, uh, I think we're up to like 55 five-star unsolicited reviews. It's a, it's a really good book. People really like it. To me, by the way, which you can probably tell, it's just a love letter to the times and to those people because these were extraordinary guys and and women and it was it was it was an amazing thing for me to go through. Thank you. So uh, we'll we'll ask you a final question and then we'll let everyone go because uh, on the East Coast it's late. So who who do you root for now? <laughs> Who's your favorite basketball team, David? If I gave you an honest answer to that, you probably wouldn't like it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Let, let me tell you what Wilt said, by the way. When the, when the leagues were, he, I was talking to him on the phone one time and he said, they call this a basketball, they call this a basketball league. When I was playing, there were eight teams. Now there's like 19. So I used to play around, uh, play, play against the top 80 players in the world. Now you're playing against the top 300 players in the world. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get into it, but I'm not a fan that much of the of the current sport because growing up there was nothing but a basketball game, and that's all there was. There was no music, there was no nothing. The game was on. You were in it with the players. You took every hit, every time out. You were breathing. Halftime, you needed it. Now they don't give you a half of a second. Something, you know, when I used to go. And I had these great seats for a while and I'd come out of it like I'd been in a rock concert. My ears would be ringing and I just, <laughs> it's just too much for me. I'm, you know, I'm not a young man anymore either. So I'm not the kid in the picture. Excellent. Well, we thank you so, so much. And uh, thank you, Norwin, for, for making the connection. Uh, David, do you have anything else? Yes, I do. First of all, I'd like to thank Danny Mando, my co-chairman. And I'd like to thank Norm Murren for arranging our speaker because this was absolutely phenomenal. 
I'd like to thank Rick Ronsberg and Creighton Cohn for our, our IT mavens who always do a great job. I'd like to thank everybody that attended the program. And I especially want to thank David Richmond because you were absolutely phenomenal. I really was impressed. This was one of the best programs we've ever had. Um, gigantic attendance. Um, I was just sitting. In, I'm a huge basketball fan, so for me, this was this was absolutely phenomenal. What team do you like, David? Uh, that would be the Boston Celtics. Sorry, I just uh, have to say this. It is the Boston Celtics. David, um, let me just let me just tell you two very quick things about Will. Okay. okay. One, I saw him throw a length of the court behind the back pass. Wow. If you can, if you, if you can imagine, that. he I was deep, he was I deep can't. in the corner of our side. And he threw behind his back to Billy Cunningham, length of the court. Okay. Another thing I saw him do with these jump ball at the at the at the uh, key at the foul line, tapped it in. Wow. I mean, he was incredible. I I watched him play a lot of games on TV, and it was amazing, amazing, amazing. All righty. So our next event of Sports Affinity will be on December nineteenth. Our program will be. Eliza Kanner. She is a senior development officer at the Combined Jewish Philanthropies. She also happens to be a New England Patriot cheerleader and was a Miss Connecticut. So wow. that will be December 19th. You don't want to miss that one, guys. Uh, let me tell you right now. Um, so if you if you David, uh, does she she has a very challenging job right now. Not the first has, thing you said and not the third thing you said. What else does she do on weekends sometimes in the fall? She's a what? A New England Patriot cheerleader. That's cheerleader. All. And what is she cheering about? Uh, not much right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, she, and it, there's a lot of other, a lot of interesting aspects to her life. So it's really, uh, it's going to be very, very interesting. Yeah, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's outstanding. She's making a lot. She's very strong, strong uh, opinions about supporting Israel and anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and what's going on. And she happens to be a, a cheerleader at the same time. So this is a big coup for us. Um, so we really hope that everyone um, marks that date and, you know, and we'll see you uh, in December. All right. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. Thank you, David Thank you, Richmond. Dave. Thank you.